Osseo. Osseo. That's a Cherokee greeting. And then we follow that by Namaste. And Namaste is to say, today we are in India. That's my theme going to be today. So now if you can go over here to this picture here. So we'll focus in on that. Um, now what I'm introducing here in this theme of India, what this means to me, this picture. And that is when I was in college and I had registered for a course in the art history of India and I went into the lecture hall for that. And right then at that time, this picture was projected up on the screen. <clears throat> And what that is and what it represents is the early, early civilization in India. Now what's coinciding is that the magazine National Geographic, <clears throat> which is on the magazine stands in the markets, is featuring ancient cities. And when I opened that up, the first one is this ancient city in India called Mohenjo-daro and that is the name that's given to this particular excavation of a city. Uh, this excavations were not very long ago at all and so it does you know show you know a city that's been excavated uh, and then on the next page there is pictured there well by itself this exact image this exact picture. <clears throat> now for me that being the initiating image that I had when I entered into uh, the lecture hall for that course has stayed with me and that's pretty representative of this ancient civilization. Uh, the figure is just being called the dancer and she does seem to resemble an African a girl. And uh, it's a bronze figure. It's you know about six inches high. And for me, why well, I'm introducing it here, uh, I figure it as the opening gate, as I might call it, to my studies and interests in Egyptian art history and in the culture of India. And that's the introduction for that. Now Uh, last week I was celebrating Navaratri that had uh, culminated for Hindu people a week before and that's what I'm continuing with and I want to read Claudia's poem from her new book Mangoes Without Borders very very suitable for India And this is her poem. It's called The Dance of Kundalini. So I need a slight explanation of what Kundalini is. Um, it's figured as an energy that is resident in every person. And it resides like a coiled serpent at the base of our spine. And that a yogi with the right practices can awaken and raise this serpent energy and as it's rising up through the body it comes to certain um, levels they call chakras <laughs> that awaken certain areas of the body until finally it comes to the very top of the person's head and blooms there as it would be like that <clears throat> And so that's basically what we're talking about with Kundalini. I would say most Hindus probably know of it. Dance of the Kundalini. To be a light, upright, standing tall, bespeaks good character, even if we fall. Values stacked, responsibility bears the weight more easily. To bend from center, left or right, 
maintains balance, loose or tight. I take a chance with aching spine, dance for Durga, my serpent charmed. I dance divine. Thank you, Claudia. Now we can go over here to this banner. This pretty much, this is a batik from India that pretty much uh, features uh, the standard iconography of Kali. That's who I'm featuring today, Kali. I started with it last week, if you can just dart over here for a minute. This was my illustrations last week. It was my painting of Kali. And this is a very standard uh, picture of Kali. And a little Murti of Kali. And another Kali from Nepal. Then we can go back over here. And look at this uh, wonderful batik of Kali. And then I'm going to read this Sakti ritual prayer for her. Homage to you, Kali Mukha. Your lion face, shocking and black as a storm cloud. You strike terror, your bared teeth shining, tongue lashing, eyes glaring as you raise a sword in midst of your dance. I praise you, burning with fiery wisdom, wearing snakes and a tiger skin, draped in bone ornaments, you complete a retinue of enlightened women. Your raging body terrifies detractors, your shrill shouts sends them afar. Your diamond-like mind penetrates the ultimate reality, I praise and render homage to you, O powerful Devi. So all of these these things of skulls and, and, and severed heads and severed hands and all this, these are all symbolic. Uh, however, in the past, credulous people really took these things literally and unfortunately did some pretty strange things. But these are all symbolic. The whole thing is symbolic. And down here we look here, this is the body of Shiva. And you know that it's Shiva because he's got the marks on his forehead and he's holding his little drum and then he has a snake around his ankle. Even as I have a tattooed snake around my ankle. <laughs> That's it. So that's Shiva. And what it means is that he is the unmanifest. He's kind of like inert without her. She is the energy. She is the Sakti energy. And that's what all of this is depicting in many ways. Um, how does she come about? Well, start with the ancient uh, Greeks, the Mediterranean. In the Mediterranean, the, I'm trying to say, post-patriarchy. And that is, there's Zeus. And out of the head of Zeus emerges Athena. Now she's armed. She's got her spear and she's got her shield. <clears throat> so very similarly, in India, we have Durga. We were with Durga last Sunday. And likewise, she's fighting demons. De demons are detractors. Demons um, like evil, but Evil in, I guess, the Christian or Western sense is a, a principle, but in India there's no such thing as a principle of evil. Uh, dukkha. Dukkha means, you know, wrong running. It, it, it's something that's come about through human error, uh, like that. <clears throat> Maybe you might say egotism in some, some people. And so that's what mostly these martial kind of goddesses are doing. They're, they're combating these, I call them detractors, in one way or, or another. And so, while Durga was engaged in some kind of a battle with these detractors, 
Then she called for a backup, as they talk on the cop shows, uh, and Kali, you know, merged out of her head, came out of her head to, you know, further combat these detractors or demons or, or asuras, they're called, you know, uh, inharmonious beings. So that's how Kali comes about. And all of, all of these things about her are all somehow related to this, but I'm just speaking symbolically, you know, and here's her up, upraised sword here. Um, and we can now we can go up here to this piece. This is the mantle piece of my theme here. It is my painting, and I've named this painting Bija. Bija means the root, the root of the world, the root of the cause. And what is taking place in this painting is Kali. Now all of this Kali or Durga and a general theme that seems to be in this uh, Hinduism is that there is a reality that somehow is hidden from us in one way or another. Uh, in this there is a golden veil. It practically seems the way it's worded in the feminine as a hymen. Only it's, it's gold, and so that's what I, I have here. And this figure says her upraised sword um, with, is kadga. Kadga means knowledge, you know, knowledge, you know, that's you know, severing away ignorance. So pretty much that's what that is. And if you can just go over there for a minute, then you can see here's her upraised sword, certainly personified with the eye in it. And you come, come back to, to this uh, that I have figured here of her. Um, let me go down here and you can look at this picture here, this portrait of Kali. She is usually shown with her tongue sticking out. Sometimes it's a very, very long tongue. And I actually knew a young female student that had an extraordinarily long tongue. Made it very difficult for her to speak. Um, so that's you know, her tongue is red, red again, you know, symbolically, it's the flame of the sacrificial fire, you know, to see that all obstacles to spiritual evolution are removed. Further, it also means speech. It also means speech by Kiri, by Kiri um, having three sections, and that is that there's oral, non-vocal, and mental. So. Basically, that's it. Botch is speech. And in my painting, I left the tongue out. She didn't need the tongue. But I have her, her teeth here and her eye. So her partially open mouth showing her teeth, meaning this is the transition, that she's transitioning from speech to seeing. This is the light in her eye, meaning inner vision. And most significantly, here you look at this. This is a written character. This is a character from the uh, Sanskrit writing called Sarada. And every character, you know, has a meaning. I mean, that's, it, it, it's a science in itself. And what this character is for is Ha. Ha. <clears throat> now, Ha is the prana. It is the powerful sakti. Um, we're, say, we're saying it, you know, with an explosive breath, ha, but what it really means is the intaking of breath. So, and it goes on in every person. It is silent. It is non-vocal. So, this is prana, meaning we're taking in life. We're taking in life. So, it's, it's a life force. And it's called the plow because, you know, it's kind of shaped like that. And that, that once that we get aware of that, then we are conscious in our breath as being this prana, this life force. So that's very much the significance of that. And this is the bindu, which is the germ of everything. And over here on this side, this is the letter K or Ka. And that there is a 
crow feather here. And that's called, you know, like kaka, kaka, kakabi, meaning there's a hidden truth. And that's very much the theme, you know, throughout this with Kali. The, the hidden, the hidden um, elements in her. So you can also go down and look at her here. This is, again, my rendition for her. Kali is the Adyasakti, the prime energy resident in the heart of creation. The heart is the nucleus of all energy transformations and is called the Hara, for it's the limit of subtlety and the mother resident in the Dahara is the subtlest of the subtle. She transcends all measures and magnitudes. No measure can encompass her. She is the basic pattern of power and the basis of the recurring creation and dissolution. So she is called Gurudama. She is all merciful and supremely fit in setting at rest all discordant elements in our being. And to go on, she is the self-revealing light principle which illumines everything. She is ever free and the root cause, bija, of everything in the world. And now her mass of hair that I have here on her head, scattered on all sides, is the veil of Maya, Indrajana, by which this reality has been covered. And even her beautiful face is conceived from our view. And she says, Itabati Mahina Samabhuva, I've become this great creation by my own power. So that's the way that we can conceive of her here. Now we go up here to this beautiful painting here. This is a Tibetan Tonka is what they call it. It's painted, actually, and the subject in this is Tara. Now, the Buddhism that is centered in Eastern Asia and mainly in Japan has avoided the feminine, has kept the feminine out of it. And the clergy of, of Japanese Buddhism avoids, if not resists, any mention of the feminine in their particular view of Buddhism. I'm pretty strong on this because of my first master's graduate paper focused on Buddhism in Japan. So I, I definitely have an idea about this. And pretty much is this, you know, now has entered into Buddhism, but it starts in the Hindu. It starts in the Hindu, and this is Tara, literally meaning star. And she is Durga now come into this, although in Hindu she was still called Tara Devi. And she is a personification of the Om, the Omkara, like that. And so she's very beneficent. Again, she is Tara, but she also has the Kali aspect, just as Durga does, you know. Prithisvara, Prithisvara um, is her Kali aspect. And all the same things, she looks just the same as Kali. Um, so it's significant for me to include this because so much of what actually was in the early Hindu that became more and more, you know, uh, legible in that culture. And then when the Buddhism, which also originated in North India, uh, then the Buddhism brought in these uh, female figures, they're called Dakinis. And so that's important to see that, you know, in this. We have a kind of a coincidence today. Um, people out walking around the lake here saw a group of women who were gathering together for a photo shoot um, who were dressed in what anybody recognizes as witches in the Halloween sense.
<laughs> and uh, uh, certainly I would, would say the, the gross depictions of Kali very much fits for Halloween. Uh, but in this particular case, we're saying that these women uh, had gathered around uh, in the trees, the trees were there in order to um, have a photo shoot like that. And that seems to fit in coincidentally with what I'm talking about. In India, then we say then we say Hindu, and then we say Buddhism. We kind of merge those together. <clears throat> there really is, you know, a women's mystique or cosmic for this part of Buddhism, not allowed into Japanese Buddhism, and that is also nature. And I just want to start, you know, with that with a. Um, Poem. I like to read these from a modern Indian poet who I've read before from Bombay, Arun Kolatir. Woman. A woman may collect cats, read thrillers. Her insomnia may seep through the great walls of history. A lizard may praise her, a sewing machine may bend her, moonlight may intercept the bangle encircling her wrist. A woman may name her cats, and the circulating library may lend her new thrillers. A naked man may wear her, and a woman may add a new recipe to her scrapbook. Judiciously distilling her whimpers, the city lights may declare it null and void. Now, in a prodigious weather, above a darkling woman, surgeons may shoot up and explode. In weather fraught with forceps, a woman may damn mankind. A woman may shave her legs regularly. A woman may take up landscape painting. A woman may poison 23 cockroaches while promoting darkness under her chair. So we keep carrying through this, this theme of, of woman and this merging of nature or animal. We can look at my drawing over here. Can you see that? Now the Durga, Durga definitely is featured as, uh, she's actually, you know, a product of the ancient, ancient uh, civilization as the woman who turns into a tiger, which I depicted last time. So the tiger is very much a part of Durga. And since Kali came out of Durga, or out of her head, uh, Kali is a cat. Now, that's my, my, uh, picture here. This is my drawing of Kali in the sense of a cat. And these women in, I don't know if it still goes on, but merged into Buddhism. We have Hinduism and we have Buddhism and we have women. The difference between the Hindu women with this and the Buddhist women is that the Buddhist league of women tamed it. They tamed down the wild part of these women and their cats um, and sort of converted this whole sensuality of women into something transcendental, something uh, mental, you could say. Uh, definitely setting as it would be a new goal that uh, Buddhists you know, strive for. Uh, but while we still are here in the women's sector where uh, women got together, that's why I was re referring to the group of women dressed as witches, uh, these women would, by costume, by makeup, or masks perhaps, would definitely act, act out, dance most likely, uh, their animals. 
is really real particular. I was trained in, in English stage acting, and it just touches upon that because if you watch an English play, everybody in that play has an animal behind their character, and that's part of the English acting is to learn your character's animal and act it out in rehearsal before you have an audience. So that's you know quite quite valid. And now these uh, women, temples, uh, in India there are millions of temples, temples and shrines, millions. There are 60 billion people in that country. So many, many, and, and, and the country is saturated with the divine. And the whole metaphysical psychology, put those together, is utterly cosmic, you know, totally. You know, er everything has a cosmic reality. So the temples themselves are, you know, designed and built and so forth to specific laws, definite rules that special people do that, just the same as the images of statues and paintings and so forth of the, of the deities. It's all very, very um, set in that way, not whimsical at all. And so these temples, uh, Koyil in Tamil, is there, they too are sacred. Tiru, Tiru is the, the Tamil word for sacred, something that's holy and sacred. So the temples are themselves sacred. They are treated that way. And the temples for this group of women that we're trying to say it this way is circular. It's circular and it's open at the top. It's not roofed. And inside there are figures, statues or murtis, of women with animal heads. So you can go right down here and look at this. So this is a humanoid, a, a person, you know, with the head of a cat. And there were other animals, bears or, or, or whatever, and this would exactly represent that kind of situation. A circular temple open at the top with figures. Murtis are, are, are representatives of women. They are women who have animal heads. Now while I'm on that subject, I want to go right down here to this piece. Now this is a miniature temple, actually a shrine, you know, a Tirthastan. Tirthastan, and this is the uh, of the, in, in the shape of a horseshoe. So it's called, you know, Gori Ke Na Tirtistan. It's a horseshoe shaped shrine. And the horseshoe shaped is for what we're trying to say in this a shrine goes back thousands and thousands of years. Uh, probably and mainly because the foot of the horse and the imprint this foot makes has the image in it of the yoni, the vulva, and so sacred in that way. And this is a miniature of that, and it's painted here is actually a vulva form on its porch. And what I've done with it here, now this, this is, a, is worshipful itself. Uh, when a person is coming from whatever the village temple uh, and comes home, the resonance from that temple will continue. Normally you would have the right kind of a lamp here to have that light that would have come from the temple and vibrated here in your home shrine. Now here, if you can see right here, what I've put here is the sword. This is the sword that Kali is holding up raised. So the sword itself is also a murti, is also, we'll say, a divinity in sort. And this is made of silver, uh, cast silver, I think, like that. And then again, this is Gadaka, Kadga, Kadga, and that this is represent knowledge, you know, to, you know, sever ignorance.
And since we have been here with the cat, and you can look at either my cat or that cat, <laughs> here's a short poem from India by Nisim Ezekiel. My cat. My cat, unlike Berlain's or Bovedere's, is neither diabolic nor a sphinx, though equally at home on laps or chairs. She will not be caressed nor play the minx. She has a single mood. She is merely bored. Yawns and walks away, retires to sleep has never sniffed at where the fish is stored, nor known to relish milk, less cat than sheep. She does not condescend to chase a rat, or play with balls of wool, or show her claws to teasing guests. But in my basement flat defies all animal and human laws of love and hate, weaving its soft moth. Cocoon. And we all recognize that, that that indeed is a a cat. So again, thinking of, of Kali and all these features that come into her, <clears throat> the the standard picture of her again, you know, and <clears throat> you can take a glance at, at this one, <clears throat> is is pretty terrible. And there's a lot, a lot of focus on that. But that's all the gross part of her. You know, that's all the obvious, and that seems to be the most <coughs> attractable to people. <clears throat> she embodies a torrent of energy that's unstoppable. Her feral persona, persona conveys the intensity of the experience of reality. Her feline rage is really the intolerance of any blocks to the flow of spiritual evolution and awakening. This cat-faced Dakini, with her animal-headed women, proclaim that she communes with every living being and it is kin to all that is sovereign, wild, and free. So I think pretty much I'm getting this across about her, my my painting is really uh, her coming out of me. I, you could say uh, I have taken her in, you know, through that kind of yoga, and this is the way that she shows herself to me. And that's why this is my man mantelpiece. So, <clears throat> and at this time, uh, we need it. We need her. We we need these views. And all of that is what I'm expressing here. Then I can finish up here with one more piece. This is really under a heading of modern Kali poets. Uh, the name I don't know, the author I don't know. But she has titled it The Dark Mother Calling. My wounded roots scratch Gaeta's center and sink into her dark waters. I am the first and the last thing you will ever see. Guardian and mystery of life and death, I am the mystery that lives in you. The veiled face of the moon, the mother and daughter, and the sterile woman whose womb never hosted life. I am the void. My dark face has been carved and painted in your idols. I am the fiery lioness, Sekhmet. Hear my roar. I am the one who whispers to the wolves. Hear my howl. I am the slayer of demons, Kali. Hear my heartbeat. I am the battle crow. Hear my war cry. I am your rage and sorrow, Agrabota. Hear my voice. I am the secret seed, Persephone, hear my song. I am the torchbearer, Hecate, hear my silence. I wander among you like a wild cat, listening to your prayers, 
instigating revolutions. I hear your cries and feel your pain. Shout, shout my name. Awake in my arms. Claim your power. Sing my song out loud, and I shall anoint you with my blood, the blood of our ancestors, witches, shamans, queens, slaves. Their blood shines brighter than the sun under your veins. It is time, it is time, honor your feminine rage. Call my names, Holly.